Do not take product if you are hypersensitive. Simon. Yeah, since we've gotten because there. Because we haven't, so we are, consider this your spoiler war- warning. Uh, if you want to see the movie and haven't yet, stop listening now. Also, go, see, go the movie, see it right now. And then come back to this part of the podcast and then come back after you've seen the movie um, and listen to this part. I will also be talking some about the book it's based on, Simon vs. the Homo Sapiens Agenda. Um, and while the plot is roughly the same, there are some differences in terms of story structure and stuff. Right. Um, so if you are planning to. If you have seen the movie and don't want book spoilers, also go read the book or listen yeah. to the audiobook. The audiobook is amazing. One of the Ooh. best one of the best readers I've listened to, and I'm really picky about audiobook readers. I um, need to do audiobooks because I'm such a podcast yeah. person that I'm just like, and oh, I'm not, great. not really a reader, so I'm just like, why don't I just fucking get audiobooks? Because it would kind of be like a podcast. Check out Audible. I really should. You, yeah. you get a free audiobook for signing up. Interesting. And yeah. they have Simon vs. Homo Sapiens Agenda. Oh, I should do it. So, you know, it's a, it's like six odd hours, six and a half okay. hours, I think. Yeah. I mean, I could easily do that. Yeah. Um, But, so Love, Simon is a movie that came out, and actually based on a couple people's, I just, I hadn't really heard of it, didn't really even see the trailer. Yeah. Uh, I had just seen a lot of people on social media being like, this was so amazing. Like me. <laughs> you being one of them, and your recommendation actually like, I, is kind of what made me get out and go see it. I've seen it four times, and I still, I'm still planning to go see it again. And let me tell you, if you see a movie four times in theaters now, that's pricey. I've and seen it twice movie. alone. Ooh, okay. Just because I, want, I just needed to go out. I mean, I was having a rough day. I was like, I need to go out and get out of my head, and this was kind of... It was perfect for this. This is this is my new. This has supplanted my previous best gay best personal gay movie. It's so good. So why did the movie resonate so well with you? I think I think I kind of know, but so there there are a few different things going on here. Um, on a more general level, it's really interesting as a gay movie because I I am someone who has seen a lot of gay movies, and yeah. there's been some talk about this about how. You know, it's you know a game movie with a happy ending and stuff. Or da, da, and, I mean, there have been game movies with happy endings. They're not necessarily common, but they exist. There have been game movies with accepting parents. There have been game movies with, you know, couples being together at the end. But this is the first movie by a mainstream studio, like by a major studio, that features a gay teen romance. Mm-hmm. Like, not the first target of teens, not the first. This is just the first. Right. First major studio movie, gay teen romance. Right. I think possibly the first one of the gay teen lead, much less romance. So it, it's historically historically significant to begin with. It, while the lead, Nick Robinson, is straight, um, Nick Robinson plays Simon. Um, interestingly, his brother actually came out right when they started filming. Oh wow. Um, but there are it's but it's you know directed by a, a gay director, Greg Berlanti, um, who's behind you know the Arrowverse. Um, I think it's his third feature film he's directed. Um, he directed Broken Hearts Club back in the early 2000s. There's another one in there somewhere that I can never think of. And he, he also, he was the youngest ever showrunner when he took over Dawson's Creek partway through. Oh, wow. Um, he created Everwood. He created, uh, um, Political Animals. Like, he has a really extensive career. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, he's he's behind the Arrowverse, like Arrow, The Flash, Supergirl, Legends of Tomorrow, and then he's openly gay. In fact, his husband actually cameos in the movie. Oh, really? Um, his husband is Robbie Rogers, who played for I think LA Galaxy. Okay. Um, one of the one of the U.S. soccer teams. Ah. Uh, for soccer teams, um, and his, and Robbie cameos as the soccer coach in the movie. Oh, cool. Um, then you've got Clark Moore, who's openly gay. He plays Ethan in the movie. Yeah. Um, who's a character original to the movie? He's not in the book. Uh, Becky Albert Halley, the author, refers to him as her adopted son. Aww. Because, <laughs> of course, her characters are her children. Right. Then you've got Keenan Lonsdale, who plays Bram, who is one of the three potential love interests, one of the three potential blues in the movie. Um, Keenan Keenan was out to friends and family. He, he plays Wally West in the Arrowverse as well. He was on The Flash at the time. He's on Legends of Tomorrow now. He was out to, like, all the Flash cast and crew and stuff, so Greg Berlanti knew that he was gay. 
but he actually didn't come out to the Love, Simon cast and crew until literally after the last day of filming. Wow. Because he had a lot of uh, anxiety around that because he, because he hadn't come out um, on that first day. He was like, well, I've, I've already, I, I already haven't said it, so it feels weird saying it now. So, and then it, got, then it got to the point where it was like, why the fuck didn't I say anything? Oh my, that's so So he came cool. out to the, kind of, the rap party. Um, and then he, so that, and then about a week later, he came out publicly on Instagram. Um, ah. He's, uh, his initial post talked about being attracted to men and women, so people were using the word bisexual. He uses the word queer as opposed to bisexual, um, right. but talks about you know being attracted to men and women both, and people of multiple genders and stuff. It's interesting and, that doing the movie like yeah, kind kinda... of pushed him towards that public announcement. And then you have Joey Polari, who plays Lyle, another potential blue, who also came out after the movie. There are incredible rumors about Miles Heiser. Who plays Cal, the other potential blue? So I, 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 I generally don't count him as one of the gay actors in the movie because he's not out if he is gay. But there are credible rumors. <laughs> Rumblings. Yeah. Um. So it wouldn't surprise me to see him come out before too long either. And the acting in this movie is. Oh my god, it's so good. And the chick, the girl. Oh fuck! What was her name? Uh, Leah or Abby. The one who was like his best friend that he didn't yeah, come yeah. to it. Uh, right. Catherine Langford. Yeah, who was um, in Thirteen Reasons yeah, Why. She was, right? Yeah, which I can't watch. But have you had like is it that you haven't watched it or that you just I haven't? refuse to. Oh, okay, fair enough. Um, because they good. basically ignored everything they were told about how to handle how to handle portraying suicide on television. Yeah, it's um, and it makes me even more annoyed now because both Catherine Langford and Miles Heiser, who plays Cal, were both in Thirteen Reasons Why. Right. Um, and then Kate Walsh plays her mother in 13 Reasons Why, and I adore Kate Walsh, and apparently it's, like, a career-defining performance. She's fantastic. But it's this fucking, like, on a personal health level, I can't watch this series. Yeah. (laughs) No, I have very mixed feelings about it. Um, and everything I heard about the cast was phenomenal. Catherine Langford, I think, actually won an award for it. She's fantastic. Um. She's a great actress. But just, like, I know that, I know that I just can't, I can't watch it. Yeah, that's totally. I but yeah, no, but she she's totally phenomenal in Love Simon as well. You've got Alexander Ship, uh, who plays Abby. She was Storm in Next Gen Apocalypse. Oh, that's okay. That's where I know her. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and honestly, I think she kind of stole the movie for me, like in, in terms of the side characters. Yeah. Um, she was amazing and is probably my favorite of Simon's friends. Yeah, mm-hmm. and what's interesting about this movie, because when you were telling your coming out story, yeah, I was like. This is why he loves the movie so much. Because this guy is like, you know, he has really good family upbringing. Yeah. Um, like fairly lots of friends, likable in school. Yeah. And yet he's going through this kind of internal confusion. Yeah. And finds the solace in Blue, who's the guy who posted. He posted like a post on a website. Yeah. Uh, the the um, there's an anonymous blog that you can right. submit to for what would that associated mean for with us? The- like a Tumblr. Yeah, in in the book, it's actually explicitly Tumblr. Oh, interesting. Um, okay. I, I I just I don't think they use the word Tumblr in the movie, but it's explicitly a Tumblr and, blog in the book. And so he finds the post, connects with him, and then they start having kind of like a secret, yeah, back and forth where it kind of just takes him on the journey of coming out. Yeah. So you've got so blue, and then Simon using the the name Jacques, Jacques, uh, because right. Jacques Eddy is French for Simon Says. Right. Um, oh, oh my god! What? They, wow. they, they mentioned that in the movie. I think yeah, and I remember being in the movie being like, oh! Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's um, really, really cool. But, um, yeah, so, so like, they don't know who each other is. They know they're both the same school because the blog is, the, the, the blog that Blue submitted to is dedicated to their school. Right, right. Um, it's an, like, anonymous blog for their school. Um, but they don't know who each other is. They don't know if they actually know each other in real life or anything. Um, so they spend... A long time. Yeah, um, it's right before Halloween in the movie. It's actually even longer in the book, because um, it's towards the end of the summer that they first start talking. Uh, but in the movie, it's right before Halloween to right around Christmas. Right. Um, and some stuff happens around Christmas that makes them... Well, I guess we're, we're spoiler territory. Yeah, we're right, totally, so we can, talk, yeah, we can right. talk freely about yeah. it. Yeah, so right until the time when, when Martin outs Simon at Christmas... Um, and then around New Year's when Blue comes back into town and sees what happened and, you know, it's like, fuck, I can't do this. And, you know, yeah. deletes his account. <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, oh. And so it's this whole, and, and the whole Odin of, of Simon. 
Oh, it's so painful. Painful to watch, yeah, very uh, painful. And, like, Nick Robinson, like, for, for a straight guy, did such an amazingly good job with playing these emotions. Yeah. And it was just, it was, there's this one bit, like, right when he gets outed, when the soundtrack just gets super discordant and he just buries his face in his bed. And it's like, I have done that. Wow, yeah. <laughs> like, I have, like, that sound that was playing is the sound that played in my head. When I was hitting those kind of moments. Yeah, wow. No, it's, it's actually funny how many points of similarity there are between Simon and I. Uh, the way he did that, the way he got up and was pacing when he was sending the first email to Blue. Yeah. Like, um, some of his physicality. He's a Hufflepuff. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I am too. I don't it, know. Just, it just keeps going. and it's like... One thing that I loved about it. Yeah. Was the segment that they did about the idea that, like, why is why is straight the default? Yeah. Why is it a default that someone's straight? And they did that whole scene about, like, oh, coming, coming out, out as straight. straight. <laughs> and I was dying laughing. I was like, this is so true to life and so true. Like, it's not like everyone comes out as straight. No, exactly. It's, it's not like you sit people down and you're like, um, just so you know, I'm, I'm straight. I like men. Yeah. You get that from your daddy. <laughs> yeah, it's so good. Oh, that entire sequence is gold. And, like, it's just a very heartwarming movie. Yeah. And, like, I lost it. Lost it. Lost it. Lost it. When, yeah. like, when he had come out to his parents and it was kind of a little bit anticlimactic. Yeah. But that he finally had that talk with his mom, who plays uh, Jennifer, Jennifer Garner. Jennifer Garner plays her, yeah. And the talk with her mo- his mom and... And she's just like, you know, like, I felt like you were holding your breath. You get to exhale now. And, you ex- and like, I'm getting chills. Even just, Oh, God. I got chills. And I, 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 I lost I'd been, cr- I'd been crying through a lot of it to that point, but I'm pretty sure that's where I became the sobbing queer mess. Because <laughs> that articulates... I mean, oh I, I, I don't know, because I'm was... straight. But, like, I can imagine that that would articulate what it's like to finally get oh, that out. Oh, God. It so was well. just... Perfect. And there are so many of us who needed to hear that. That's just that. that it's just, such a simple way to say it. Yeah. That, like, resonates probably with so many people. Oh, yeah. No, it was like... The idea of exhaling. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was a it, fun, fun fact about that scene. That wasn't in the movie. Until, really? Until Jennifer Garner insisted on it. <sighs> Jennifer Garner. She was like, there needs her. to be this moment with his mother... Oh. Um, and then I think Berlanti himself was actually involved in writing it because there were really? these two script writers who adapted the book. Oh, um, okay. I can't remember who they are offhand, but um, so the two these two script scripters adapted it. But then I think Berlanti actually had a hand in getting that scene together because he, I believe, actually drew upon some of his own coming out experiences for it. Wow. Um, and that was just so beautifully acted. Like Jennifer Garner was like a force of nature in this movie. It was perfect. It was it was the most perfect, and like that's where I oh. really lost. Like I, I, I do cry a lot with movies. Like I usually am just like the welling up person. Yeah. But at this point, it was like full blown. Oh like, yeah, no. I had tears, and like my friend that I was with was crying too. We're both straight girls. Like, like, but we like we just thought it was so beautiful. Yeah, and, like, and, it was, and it was so well done. So well like, done. It's, like it's, I was prepared to support this movie because it was historically significant. Yeah. And now I've seen it four times. Yeah, it's just, it's, I encourage anyone to go see it. And the other part that I really thought was the whole Odin part, like the part where the guy, um, what was his name? The friend that Odin Simon. Martin. Martin. Ah, uh, that well, fucking friend. Martin. Fucking <sighs> Martin. I remember even just watching that and just being like, I hate this guy. He's such a Martin. Yeah. <laughs> it just seems with, like a Martin name. The, like the scene in the parking lot when he's like, I didn't think anyone did that anymore. It's like... Yeah. Oh, God. It, so, rem- it reminded me of, and I don't, you, maybe you've heard of this, but on Survivor, um, there was, there's a trans man. Okay. And someone owed him as trans at Tribal Council. Oh. Before he had actually formally come out saying that he was trans. I remember hearing about that. It was huge. Um, and like, and the person did this kind of, to try to get advantage or whatever, and everyone turned on this person. Uh-huh. Um, and the person who did it, again, kind of like Martin in the movie, didn't think anything of it. Yeah. And it reminded me of that, and I was just like, holy fuck, to just have this, like, thing. And the way that Simon says it in the movie, which is, is like, that was my thing. Yeah. Like, you took that away from me. 
I was supposed to decide yeah. how I wanted to tell people. And what's interesting about that is, like, he told a friend, like, he had... It wasn't as close of a friend as the other girl. Yeah, so, you, so, you had, so yeah, so... Because it's Leah and Nick, his best Leah, friends for right. ages. And then Abby, who's the new one in town. Abby. He came uh, out to Abby. Yeah. Not... Not Leah. Not Leah. Um, and that's super realistic, because... They touched on this briefly in the movie and a little a little more thoroughly in the book. Um, but it's the idea that there's not as much risk with Abby. Right. Because it's still a relatively new friendship. They've only been friends at this point for about three, three and a half months. Right. Um, so new friends. Like new friends. friends. So there's, there's not the same amount of risk. Because while it would suck to lose Abby, it's not the same as losing, losing yeah. a limb. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. Um, and you mentioned earlier that the way the friends reacted to him coming out. Yes, yeah, we were talking this was before real, we started recording. Was, was, real, it was realistic. super realistic. Um, yeah. So as I was talking before the, we started actually recording um, about the contrast between how the friends react in the movie versus the book. Because they react much more severely in the movie. Because, mostly, Martin's even, even more of an asshole in the movie than he's in the book. Which means Simon does more in the movie than in the book. Which gives his friends more to react to. Right. Like, uh, the book is nothing about lying about Abby having a college oh. boyfriend or or like lying to Nick about Abby liking Martin or anything. Um, he doesn't push Nick and Leah together in the same way. Right. So there's not as much to react to as right. there was in the book. Uh, sorry, no, there's not, there's not as, in the, the, sorry, yeah, not as much yeah. to react to as there was in the movie. Right. Um, book, so, movie. book versus movie. Yeah. <laughs> Words are hard. <laughs> I'm a writer. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, so I think, I think it was really realistic. Like, a lot of the fandom has a tendency to side with Simon mm-hmm. with regards to this. That, you know, like, but but he's coming, he, he just got outed and he's going through all the shit. And it's like, yeah, but they're also going through shit. And he just spent like a month and a half. Playing with them. No, but... two months. Because it, it was before Halloween right. to Christmas, Christmas Eve. Two months literally fucking with their relationships. Yeah. So, yeah, and their emotions. They're going like, to be mad regardless of whether or not he's gay. Yeah. And like, it's like, like... As a friend, you made me mad. Yeah. Like, you're gay, like, going through this thing. But, like, you made me mad as from a person-to-person level. Yeah. Made me mad, yeah. Um, and, and like, I say this as someone who, while not for the same reasons, it didn't have, actually have anything to do with, with my being gay or anything like that, um, did a lot of really similar shit. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, in some of my personal relationships where... I was lying about things for months or years and trying to hide things and all this kind of stuff and kind of fucked with some people, not meaning to fuck with them, but to kind of keep my secret and make it, make everything not change. Right. Um, so I say that as someone who has done these like very similar things, they don't owe him fuck all. Exactly. Did your friends kind of react similarly? Um, a little bit. It was it was actually more familiar than friends. Um, oh, like it was okay. more of my family than, than actual friendships and stuff. So it was not quite the same because there's different levels there with family than friends. Right. But I mean, there there was some legitimate severe reactions to some of this stuff because I'd been lying about shit for like, I think two years at one point for oh, some wow. of it. Yeah, for some of it. So it's like, it sucks. But... And you know what? Like, and and the normal reaction will be to be mad, but. Yeah, you get through it if you love the person. Yeah, and, and like you know, and, and like there was a lot of, there was a whole lot of emotion behind what I was lying about. So while my my reasons weren't necessarily they weren't necessarily good, but they were understandable. If that right. makes sense. Yeah, I would say um, so. So like you know, everything worked out in the end, and things got resolved, and apologies are made on both sides and stuff, and like everything kind of got forgiven. Um, but there needed to be some time. And yeah. I think that's, I think that was really, not just realistic, but important to show his friends needing time from this. Uh-huh. Uh, especially, like, honestly, if Simon had taken five minutes between Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve to sit his friends down and say, yeah. hey, by the way, so all this was fucking Martin, he was blackmailing me, I did a lot of really shitty stuff and lied to you about these things. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That would have been completely different. Right. And again, I get why Simon didn't. I get that avoidance reaction. Like, I understand that intimately. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like 
kind of spinning your wheels. Yeah. I imagine you're delaying the process. Exactly. Because you're not quite ready yet. Exactly. And so you're doing these things. You're kind of hurting the people around you indirectly. Like, yeah. you don't mean to and you, don't, you probably don't want to. But you but can't. You're doing but you it. can't not. Exactly. And it, you, just, you have to deal with the consequences. So, what did you think of who Blue was? So I was you, super happy. I was too! Both me and my friend who we went to see it, we were just like, we were both hoping for that person. Okay. Funny thing is, um, in the book, Simon never suspects Bram. Oh. Because like, in the movie it's structured, so there are some major structural differences between the book and the movie. And part of that, I think, is you need more setup at the beginning for the movie because of the way they're relying on kind of the whole John Hughes teen movie tropes. Mm-hmm. Um, because the the book opens with the blackmailing. Yeah. Which is like a third of the way into the movie. That's very true. Yeah. And just, oh, I should read this book. You should. Um, or listen to it. Like I said, the reader's, I the reader's amazing. Listen. So which do you like better? Oh, don't make me pick. <laughs> <laughs> there are things I like more in the movie and things I like more in the book. Yeah. They're both great. They're both great. <laughs> do them both. Read or listen to the book and go see the fucking movie. Yeah. Um, there, I think, I think there's some things in the movie that really shows that there was actually a gay hand involved in a way there wasn't. Because the Becky Albertalli, who wrote the book, um, has a background as a child psychologist, but is straight. Okay. Um, so she's writing from kind of her professional experience rather than her, rather than her personal experience. Ah. Um, whereas with the movie, you've got Greg Berlanti involved and, you know, he is, is gay and right. so is like half the cast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That definitely would help, I would imagine. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there are some things that are handled a little better in that regard. Like, I, I don't even know that I could pick out anything, anything specific. Uh, right. But as a, kind of as a, as a general feel. Right. Like, you can tell, oh, there's a little more of a gay hand involved in this than there was in the book. Right. But they're both amazing. Yeah, so the, the, the movie starts earlier, but the book ends later. Oh, okay. Like, the book goes a little beyond Wait, that kind of carnival. Thing. Right, the current. Um, and there are some structural differences. Like I said, you know, Martin's not as bad in the book, which means Simon isn't as bad. So the the outing is a little bit a little bit less dramatic. Oh, okay. Um, and in fact, while in the movie, Blue abandons Simon during the outing, he doesn't in the book. Oh. And they keep talking. Huh. Those are interesting choices for them to make from the movie point of view. It's super interesting, but I think. I think there are changes that need, needed to be made. Um, I don't think some of these things would have worked as well on screen as they did in the book. I mean, that the, the last scene, or like I guess it was technically like the second last scene. Yeah, the carnival the, scene? The, the, the Ferris wheel. Like he essentially, he essentially puts it out on the, vlo- on the blog or website yeah. that right. he's going to be at the carnival and like... Yeah, Come let's find let's me. have this big grand moment, the teen romance thing. It was so like, and I hate saying it, but it was really cheesy. But I fucking loved it so much. Oh my god, it was so cheesy, <laughs> but it was it was cheesy in that John Hughes teen movie vein. Yeah. So like, this is the gay John Hughes movie, basically. It's so 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 true. Like this is the so this, true. This is this is my sixteen candles. Aww. This is my Breakfast Club. Wow. You should tweet um, that at them. I really <laughs> love that. I mean, I mean, Berlanti said that he actually took a lot of inspiration from John Hughes on wanting that kind of experience for this movie, right? Yeah. So, like, that's, that was their goal, and they succeeded admirably. They really did. Like, like in my mind watching that scene, I'm like, like okay, it's not looking good. It's not looking like this person's showing up. But I know they're going to show up. They're gonna, they can't not show up. Like, this yeah. like it's not, the movie's not going to end with the person not showing up. And then um, and then he shows up, and it's just this, like... <sighs> yeah. And while the carnival scene exists in the book, it's, again, very different. Because yeah. Simon's there all day, but it wasn't a public post. It was an email directly to Blue. So it wasn't... And people weren't, like, watching People him. weren't lined up and watching. I think I'd like that better. Um, it works better for the book. The big grand gesture works for the team movie they feel they're going for. So it's one of those things like, I would not want that to happen necessarily in real life, but I'm really glad I got it on screen. Yeah, it's a theater experience. It's a movie experience. Yeah. It's, it's a film experience, yeah. But yeah, no, so in the in the book, um, Simon's there kind of um, after the show. It's Oliver in the book rather than Cabaret. And I'm, I don't know why they swapped it, but I'm really glad they did. <laughs> mm, interesting. And uh, it's like, you know, late at night and he's kind of on the last ride before 
that shuts down for the night, and Bram shows up kind of at the last minute and joins him on the Total Whirl. Oh, wow! It's the Total Whirl, which is a callback actually to something earlier in the book, because uh, they're actually even more obsessed with Oreos in the book than they are in the movie. Oh, yeah, the Oreo thing, yeah. Yeah, even more obsessed with Oreos. Um, and Simon and his sisters, because there's two sisters in the book, uh, Alice is his older sister, um, have this uh, whole thing they came up with this kids called the Shorio, which is kind of an Oreo land and this whole big Oreo diet and stuff. Oh, and wow. and Blue has this thing about hey, you know, I, I I had a phase where I couldn't eat Oreos at all because I ate a deep fried Oreo at a at a fair and then went went to the Total World and then <laughs> threw up everywhere. Oh my god! I, oh. So getting on the Total World as well is this whole big kind of like I can only do it for you. Oh, um, interesting. The Tilt the World rather than the Ferris Wheel. Yeah, but th- I think that, but I think the because fa- there's no also there's no Ferris Wheel mention in the initial post in the book because we don't actually we don't even get the initial post kind of thing really. Right. So the Ferris Wheel in the movie is a callback to that, which that you know up and down kind of thing, which r- was a really good image. Yeah. And thus, and you know, then we get that bookend with the initial post and the Ferris Wheel at the end. Which is fantastic. Which is fantastic. And really pretty to look at, too. Yeah, and then bookended a little bit further out by Simon picking up his friends and the iced coffees. And, and the, yeah, because the opening scene is, like, him with his friends, getting coffee, going to school, and then, like, the end scene is that scene. Yeah. Except we, with, with... With Bram added in. Um, yeah. Because there's this really great, you know, overhead shot looking down at handing the tray of four iced coffees out to Simon in the car, where they go pick up Abby... And then, at the end, there's this really great, the, the same shot, except they're handing five Hi. iced coffees out. And you're going, wait, wait, what? Are they? Oh my god, they are? And then they pick up Abby and then Bram. It's so and it good. it was just, oh. It was the perfect way to end it. And there's been, I've been seeing a lot of talk online, people talking about, you know, how important that big Ferris wheel kiss is. But then, you know, two minutes later, we get this little, you know, Every day. little peck like they like Bram gets in the car and he and Simon just have this little quick peck and it's just that casual comfortable relationship kiss. Right. It's like yes, we're dating, we're comfortable, we're greeting each other. And it's just like that's almost even more important. It's the everyday like routine like Exactly. Like it's showing that they're like in it now. Exactly. And it's not this big like this big thing. This oh. And I got to mention the fact that the Bleachers are one of my favorite bands. And they have three songs in the movie, uh, and uh, it ends with Wild Heart, which is my favorite Blazer song. If you want to make favorite... me cry right now, play Wild Heart. <sighs> well, I don't want to cry, though. <laughs> but I I love... mean, please it's... don't play it right now. But it... I mean, in a general sense, if you want to make me cry, play Wild Heart. <laughs> it's such a good song. Um, and, like, it was my favorite Bleacher song even before, like, Love, Simon. Yeah. And knowing that that song was in that movie... I hadn't even heard of Bleachers. Oh, they're so good. They're so good. Well, it's, it's, it's Jack Antonoff. Yeah, yeah. Um, who was also a music music supervisor on the movie. The, and you can tell. Yeah. You can fucking tell. Um, so Rob Simonson did the score, which is also phenomenal. And so 80s, like yeah. in the best way. Um, yeah. And then Jack Antonoff was a music, music supervisor. There are, I think actually four on the soundtrack. I, I think yeah. I think it's four all together. Oh, is it four all? Because it's Roller Alfie Coaster. Alfie Song, Roller Coaster, Wild Heart, Heart, and something else. You're right. There is four. Yeah, there's four Bleacher songs on the soundtrack. Um, there's another song they did. Yeah. I have it on my Spotify. Um, but yeah. I, yeah. Just ending with that scene. I was just like, I'm destroyed. I'm just, I'm just, not, not in a bad way at all. And that's one thing I should say. Like, when I say that I'm destroyed, I mean, like... In a good way. It was emotional, and it was cathartic, and it was just a beautiful movie, and I was, everyone I, needs I, to see it. I, I talk about having, like, being a queer sobbing mess. Like, I was I was a wreck coming out of that movie in the absolute best way. Yeah, I bet it felt good. Did you oh cry every single time? Um, yes. None as severely as the first time. Right. Uh, but I, I at least welled up, or, you know, there were, in there were like, a few tears kind of thing, and just because it was just... It's just so powerful. It's so good. Everyone oh. fucking see Love, Simon. Go fucking see it. Go and, see and it. And the thing is, the better this movie does, and it's been doing incredibly well. Yeah. Um, like, last I checked, and this was like a week and a half ago, because it had a budget of $17 million. Oh, yeah. Wow. So, I mean, it's not, that's not a very big budget for a movie. No. 
And last I checked, it was around $45 million. Wow! And that's before... I think that's before it even opened in the UK. Because it's still opening up around the world. Crazy. And, yeah, you're, you're right. If people go see it, um, maybe more movies like this and that's, that's will exactly come it. out. Because there's been a lot of talk about how, you know, this is very much a very specific kind of coming out experience. Uh-huh. Like, Simon is, you know... He has good friends. He has loving parents. He's accepted. It's it's the happy sixteen candles of gay movies. Mm-hmm. Um, but yet it. And there there are a lot more experiences to show. Right. The better this does, the more likely major studios are going to start looking at making more of these experiences. Right. And that's something that Berlanti's actually talked about. You know, saying, "Hey, this is just one experience. There are more to show. So many more to show. Let's start doing that." Oh my god, so true. Um, and I hope they do. Oh, me too. <laughs> Dang. And, and like, I feel like it's, it's doing super well. I mean, like, it's, I mean, it's not making hundreds of millions of dollars. Right. But they're making a profit on it. <laughs> and it's critically well received. Oh, it's so well received. Like, across the board, just, yeah. Oh. Yeah. And, and it's not perfect. None of these movies are going to be, but it's the closest to perfect I've seen. I also thought it was really funny. Like, oh from my a god. comedy standpoint, there was a lot of really funny parts. Oh my god, those kids are amazing for comedy. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, it's, it's actually really funny. But man... <laughs> Sorry, just thinking about Simon helping his dad with the uh, presentation, the slideshow. Oh, yes! <laughs> oh my god, the whole dad oh storyline was really interesting. And can I say Josh Duhamel is even hotter now than he was before? He's aging quite well. Oh my god, I would climb him like a tree. <laughs> Me too. Whatever. Um, Back off, Fergie. <laughs> Are they together? Yeah, I think they're married. Oh, cool. Yeah. I, I haven't then, followed him at and all. And Fergie, yeah. But I thought that was an interesting uh, storyline, just the idea that the dad kind of reacted not good or bad. He just kind of... It didn't, wasn't didn't really know how a, to react. It was didn't a, know how to react, and then and then he like broke down in front of him like, and stuff. And I was just like, he he, he had he needed the, he needed that time to process um, because it's a huge adjustment for his worldview. Yeah. And for his reaction to be not "you didn't tell me," but I should have seen it, and I've been hurting you all of these ways without even knowing it. And that's why he was kind of upset and kind of left yeah. in a huff in a way. Is because he was feeling guilty. Exactly. Not because, like, he was mad or angry at the sun in any way. Oh, it's just... It's very real. It's so real. Very real.